Hello. Nice to meet you again. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining me and thanks for staying with me. I, I've, you know, I've asked for some feedback from some people that watch regularly and they all say it's not too long, it's not this, it's not that. We enjoy it. So I shall carry on. So thank you very much for your support. I do so enjoy doing this. So we've got fascinating fact that's about a seahorse. I'm going to read you a little story, Jack and Ori, because some, yeah, I had some feedback to say they enjoyed Pete's oak tree. Well, this is a story. Not it's not a story. It's do you remember right in episode one? I said I might read you my story, and uh, of course I've updated it a bit because Mum's been chatting away and you know all of that. So uh, yeah, I've been able to update it. So as we go along, that's what I'm doing. So I'll read you the first bit just so you can sit and have a cup of tea or get your dinner on while you're listening. Yeah. Let's tell a story, Jack and Ori. It happens to be my story. And then I'm going to start with a little chit-chat, show you a few bits. I've had a question about colour with quilts. So I'll talk about that. And then... Uh, oh, I'm going to do adult. That's right, I'm going to go over adult in TA. And then I've got a little little film at the end. I'll talk about that when we get there. So let's start, shall we? And where a better place to start than with last week? <laughs> so last week, do you remember I talked about the lighthouse? Of course, I've been inundated now with these things about lighthouses. And my darling next door neighbour, and she said, I met her going on the train to visit my daughter. And we had a journey up there. And she said, oh, I've, I get this magazine. I really love it. It's called Evergreen. And uh, she said she's written a piece for it and it was published. And we're going to, we're going to uh, subscribe because there's lots of, well, it's just all interesting articles. The snippets of a Cornish childhood. And it's, well, it's just what I'm doing here, really. Chin wagging, Punch and Judy. And uh, there's a bit on the Silly Isles, which is why she lent it to me. But the bit I just picked up on, I mean, I'd never really thought about lighthouses before. But after doing that bit last week, light bulb moment. Have you ever felt the urge to pack up your life and escape the daily grind? Definitely. John Harris and Helen Mason know that feeling. The Norfolk couple took the plunge, uprooting their lives in East Anglia uh, to take over the Causewall Lighthouse Hotel near Stranra, Stranra, that's it, in southern Scotland. Causewall Lighthouse was designed by Robert Louis Stevenson's grandfather and built in 1815. It acquired a few smash windows when Concord flew overhead in 1970. The Causewall Lighthouse Hotel is located in what was the lightkeeper's accommodation with fantastic views of the lighthouse itself and the surrounding scenery. And when I looked up, uh, the guy, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson's um, grandfather, he was, he was a prolific lighthouse designer. And where did he take his inspiration from? But, yeah, the lighthouse that I talked about last week uh, with the oak tree. And he built several all around Scotland. And he took that design. And, of course, it was a super design, one that stood up, you know, to, to being used again and again. But dear old Robert Louis, he couldn't, um, he couldn't go into this, you know, profession as did his uh, grandfather and father, because he had a very weak chest. And so he went into writing. And we know Robert Louis Stevenson, he wrote Kidnapped and Treasure Island. And uh, um, was it? Uh, oh, I did look it up. Oh, you know, uh, anyway. Hold far, I'll just look it up. Oh, what's it called? Oh, it doesn't it annoy you when your brain goes like this. Hang on. My, it was on the tip of my tongue, but I just, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. So, yeah, Robert Louis Stevenson. So, 
his forebears were all lighthouse, you know, designers and uh, engineers and all of that. So there I was reading about the lighthouse. I would never have picked up on that if I hadn't talked about that fascinating fact. But it's a lovely little book. I might read some little bits out if it's allowed. And then blow me down. I've got some cards out of the desk drawer. And uh, what is it? Smeaton's Tower from an original by Jean Mintoff. So there we are. It's links, isn't it? Everything links when you haven't looked at anything before and then you look at something and Bob's your uncle. And that's the same with uh, the seahorse. I'll tell you about that in a minute. First of all, I want to talk about, I had a question from someone about colour when I do quilts. And I was saying how, you know, you can get all these different scraps just lay them down if anything stands out take it out put it back oh it's not something that you can rush take it out put it back spread it out even cut it out and if you don't like it take it out put it back and then you might take a a, a, a photo on your phone in black and white and then anything that's not quite right tends to stand out and just because you bought it doesn't mean to say you've got to use it. So for Tommy's quilt, as I, I showed you, um, I got the fabric. Well, last week, uh, Heather came round and we had a jolly good old, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? It took a long time, a long time. And this was the fabric I had, do you remember? It all looks, you know, it's all, no way, Jose. No way, Jose. Those two, that, I mean, I wanted to use it. It didn't go. It killed everything. It killed everything. So this is what I've gone with, that. Oh, and another one, a little blue one. I, oh, it must be upstairs, but a little blue flower. And I'll show you some next week as I, I cut it out and um, I sew it. I'll show you how I do it. But I had to take that one out. Now, you would have thought it would go with the colours there. You would have thought that it killed it. So just because you bought it doesn't mean to say you've got to use it. Oh, sorry, I vibrated. So that's that. And then I want to show you um, Peach Jumper. I finished it. Here it is. I'm pleased with it. He wanted something that was subtle, he said. I'll stand up. What do you think? Sleeves. The bottom. And it's got that little roll bottom. And the little roll around the neck. He's going to like that because it's not... It's not... Um, you know, the typical ribs. So that's it. So it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. You, you saw, didn't you? You knit the bottom, you knit in the round up to the arms and then you knit the two sleeves and then you join all that and you knit the yoke. However, you do have to leave the sleeve stitches, some of them, just the underarm bit um, on some waist yarn or, or, you know, holder. And then you think, oh, how am I going to join it? And you join it with what they call kitchener stitch. Oh, it's just such an easy stitch. Knit, knit, slip, purl, knit, purl, slip, purl. But there's a, there's a, a great thing. Ellie on Craft House Magic, she's done a little film. So if ever you, I do know someone who's who's doing one and the little uh, YouTube uh, hint is you've got a little bit of a gap before the stitches on the needle. Pick up two extra stitches either side. That's fine. And then you can just do the kitchener and bind them. And it makes a lovely... Uh, you can see where I've done mine. And you see, and so you, you kitchener them together, and that's it. So I'm quite pleased with that. 
So I'll put down below the colours that I used and it's really not hard. It looks effective but it's not hard at all. I wouldn't say that was in any way hard. And it's rustic wool. You can feel it. You can see it. So, that's that. Oh, so what have I got on my needles now? Oh, I've got to go and get it. Um, I bought it at Stuart Yarns. And the colourway is called Into the Storm. And the base is Merino. 85% merino and 15% nylon yeah and into the storm and you can see why oh now I've dropped it <laughs> there look there's these little bits of stormy weather it's quite hard for you to see can you see that little bit of stormy weather coming there? It's going to be interesting how it knits up light and dark into the storm. And that was us, wasn't it, going to Isla? Now that's jogged my memory because just out the blue, Nicholas sent me two photographs of us and Isla when he was 16. And because I've lost mine, I don't know where they are unless I gave them to him. But anyway, this one he found on his phone. Uh, somebody sent it to him. Uh, in the group that we were with and it's us going across to the paps of Jura uh, and yeah, yes so I'll pop that up here so that links in with last week's you know yeah and so into the storm going to Isla on that plane there's usually a storm when we travel we like to blame our friend Heather she always says it's her bad weather but we often get bad weather too right let's put that over there oh I'm getting warm now that's it. Whew. I don't think I need all that on. It's lovely. Oh, I knitted this a long time ago. It's in fingering weight, which is very, very fine. And I love it. Absolutely love it. You can wear it all different ways. That's it, that way around. I've knitted several, but it's so warm, but so light. And isn't that lovely? Just to have, oh, I know somebody would like that. I was talking to them yesterday. They were sitting with a hot water bottle, hand warmers and a quilt over their lap. And I was sitting like this because it's, it's so warm down south, but they were in Scotland and it's chilly. So it's beautiful sunny weather here today as you can see by the reflection. I'd like to sit that way round so I've got the garden behind me instead of these doors but the light won't take it. So oh I'll show you what I'm knitting with that wall shall I? Yeah he asked for it so I always like that because he knows what he wants and um, it's I think I've shown it to you before yeah it's called the Marple Ridge Sock and it's from custom socks but I showed you that in earlier in earlier um I like I like the way she talks it's she's great so that's what I'm starting so I'll let you know how I go on so what else to show you oh I got a parcel I got the fabric so reasonable I couldn't resist it's Tilda you know I love Tilda oh oh, oh it's lovely isn't that exquisite? Oh, the colour. Oh, the colour is beautiful. And so that's one. That was the remnant. I got that for five pounds. Oh, that was good. That was a beautiful remnant. He put that there. Look at this one. Oh, the colours. Oh, they're just gorgeous. This one I got as a contrast. It's 
Oh, I think it's very, it would make a nice bag, wouldn't it? Same design, different colour. I'm really pleased with those, really pleased with those. So that's what I'm going to be doing too, making a bag and knitting the socks and also just now and again doing a bit of the quilt but I'll show you that as I go along. Maybe. And someone was saying to me, oh you know I'm doing this and I want to finish it because I want to start that. But you know, yes, just start it, just enjoy it, enjoy because sometimes we're in the mood to do this and sometimes we're in the mood to do that and you have to just enjoy it it's a, it's it's a hobby and so don't yeah give yourself permission to do something else as well so I'm going to well I'll give myself permission I'm not giving myself permission to do this but it is something on my wish list and I was looking at it it's a coloring thread by Tula Pink and she has some embroidery oh some lovely embroidery for example that's an elephant you look at it that's intriguing isn't it and I think there's a frog that's quite well there's quite a lot they're all well I love them Let... oh here's the frog a fly frog king isn't he grand? Oh, that reminds me. Daisy Do, I had to have her put to sleep. And it's been hateful. We've had her for so many years. And her darling friend, like Sussex, you know, lost the feathers. They're growing, but she's still losing a few. But, oh, she's just wandering round, wandering round, looking for her. It's heartbreaking. Every time I go down there, she expects me to bring her back. That is the worst part. It's bad enough losing Daisy Do, but having her friends mourn for her or not know where she is, it's ghastly. I can hardly bear to go down there at the minute. A duck. And then I love what I'm going to do, you know, when I'm in the in the frame of mind is the seahorse. Isn't that cute? So it got me looking up about seahorses. <laughs> I know. Where does my brain go, I tell you? Seahorses eat up to 30 to 50 times a day. And the little fry, they're called fry, you know? I'm going to put a, a little film of all the fry being born. I hope you can access it down below. It's only about a minute and a half, but it's worth watching. They eat three. They can eat up to 3,000 pieces of food a day. It's amazing, isn't it? They're actually a fish, which, of course, I knew they were fish, but I had to be told they were fish because they're horses, surely. Seahorses, no, they're fish. Um, there's two types, spiny and short. Short snouted, that's right, short snouted. You find them up in the Shetlands, the west coast, and then coming down the south coast. They're not really eastward yet, but they are coming east of England. But yeah, down there. But they're, they're really under threat, of course, isn't everything under threat? Why? because the Chinese medicine trade takes 150 million. The curio trade takes 1 million. Yeah, you can buy them, can't you? You know, with shells and all of that. The pet trade takes a million and not many survive after six weeks when they're put in tanks. You have to know what you're doing to keep them going. They can't chew, they're like a vacuum cleaner. They've got excellent eyesight. I thought this was amazing. One eye looks that way, one eye looks the other way. They just can look for, you know, what's happening 
independently their eyes were. I wish mine could sometimes. I'd love to look that way, you know, to be able to see behind me. Anyway, they're the only creature where the male has a true reversed pregnancy. The female transfers the eggs to the male and it takes about four, 14 days to four weeks for them to gestate. And the birth process is a long one. It can take up to 12 hours. And they can have up to 1,500 little fry. And that's what I show you. Psh, out they come. Psh, out they come. And it's a, it's a lovely little film down below. But the interesting bit is they've got this grasping tail. Well, we've all seen it, haven't we? How they grasp around the reeds and that. Why? To resist the current. And a cross-section now tells us that that tail is square, not round. It allows for more surface area to be gripped. It's more difficult to de dislodge it. So the, the little bones are square, not round. They've got overlapping bony plates with many joints. And the plates slide over each other absorbing the energy, you know, because they can be in quite a current, can't they? And this prevents damage. But what's man doing? Again, copying nature. They're making search and rescue robots and they're making surgical, equi surgical equipment in the same way with these square and overlapping why because they can resist the currents if they're out there and the surgical equipment they can you know get round into all the different places it said assistant the professor of robotics he said his name was ross hatton and he said human engineers tend to build things that are stiff so they can be controlled easily but nature makes things just strong enough not to break and then flexible enough to do a wide range of tasks. And that's why, he said, we can learn a lot from animals that will inspire the next generation of robotics. So I thought that was interesting. And that all came about by me seeing the seahorse. <laughs> can you believe it? Where am I going now? I'm going to read you a story, Jack and Ori, and then I'll do some some TA with you. I'll see you in a minute. My friend Sonia had recently qualified as a counsellor and attended a seminar where she was taught to use buttons in symbol work to help people see themselves and their circumstances more clearly. It was a technique that I found very helpful in my own work when I too qualified as a counsellor working for the NHS for some 18 years until my retirement in 2020, just as it happened at the beginning of lockdown. However, when Sonia unscrewed her jar and tipped out a pile of buttons, I was intrigued. She began arranging them on the table. I looked up and down the rows and saw amongst others a small black button, a large red button, a blue plastic one, different sized brown leather ones that would suit an Aaron cardigan or tweed jacket. In fact, just an ordinary mixed variety that we have in our button boxes. I've always liked buttons. My button collection has grown to enormous proportions, but I love them all. I've inherited my nan's button box, my mum's button box, and have made my own over the years. I wondered what was coming next. She asked me to choose a button that represented me. I quickly and instinctively chose a square mother of pearl button with cut off corners. This was me aged about 10 years old. I was shiny in many different ways. I felt a bit special. I enjoyed life and was happy, I said, turning the button between my fingers. I felt quite amazed that I was able to relate to a button. And when Sonia asked if there was anything else, I found myself adding, yes, it's the shape of it. I was having the corners knocked off me. I was surprised by what I was saying 
and I also found myself feeling a little angry. This started me thinking. What did this mean? I decided to write about my life to see if I could find out. And where better to start than at the beginning? My childhood was quite ordinary. Nothing special, I want to say. But of course, on reflection, it was quite special. I was loved by a mum and dad who were doing their best to make life comfortable for me and who wanted to give me the best opportunities life could give. The war had finished four years earlier. Things were beginning to settle down and hopes were high. It was boiling hot on the 8th of August 1949, the day I was born, and that's something that stayed with me. I like bright days and sunshine. In one of the few photographs of myself, when I was tiny, Mum's holding me and I'm wearing an Angora hat. We still both have a love of wearing super soft wool. Well, cashmere now. And when I knitted my own baby's first dress, I too used Angora. It's so soft, warm and comforting. Mum and Dad were 18 when they were married, which seems young, but they had been working since they were 14, were living through the Second World War and together they had a lot of life experiences. They met at a dance held at the Tottenham Royal and very quickly fell in love. Mum's mum was seriously ill and Dad was like a knight in shining armour, she says. He used to get on three buses to get from his house in Dagenham Road, Leighton, to hers in Highbury and would usually produce some tasty treats for them all. Very special because of strict rationing at the time. After my nan died, their relationship became even stronger and on the 24th of December 1944 they were married. She says, with such affection, that Ethel, my dad's mum, and her neighbours put on a lovely spread for them, neighbours and friends helping with their ration coupons. Mum borrowed a wedding dress from a lady that she worked for in a paper shop. Her husband was a prisoner of war and she lent her the dress. Mum's dad stayed with Nanny and Grandad. And as it was Christmas Day the next day, they took good care of him and she's forever grateful for that. A great part of her heart is, is saying thank you to Nanny and Grandad for looking after him as he was on his own because her mum had died. They honeymooned in the house opposite Dad's in Leighton as the neighbours had gone away for a couple of days. Such was life then. After they were married, they lived in two rooms at Highbury, North London. The front room was a bedroom and it had a single bed because furniture was rationed and money was tight. The back room was a tiny room, Mum says, with a gas stove but no sink. So Dad put a Victorian vanity unit on the landing with a bucket underneath in which the water was collected. A water tap was on the next landing down and Mum would collect what she needed in a jug. They shared a downstairs toilet. Housing was very short as bombing had taken its toll on London. Coal and other heating fuel was scarce which must have been awful in the freezing winter of 1946-47. No wonder they waited five years before they had me. Also, a contributing factor was that in 1946, Dad went into the Air Force and was stationed near Norfolk, so Mum was on her own for a couple of years. Anyway, I was due at the beginning of September 1949, and it was a surprise when Mum went into labour early. Most women had their confinement at home, but Mum's GP trained at University College Hospital and said she wanted her to have the baby there as Mum's rooms weren't suitable. This well-funded London teaching hospital was no ordinary one, but as the National Health Service had started the year before, Mum was now entitled to attend. The NHS was costing two and six a head per week, 12 and a half pence in today's money. Mum was having tea with friends when her pain started, and as they had a car, they took her to the hospital. How fortuitous! 
That was Sunday afternoon, and I was born on Monday evening around 8 around eight p.m. I was 20 inches long and weighed six pound five ounces. When I asked her if I was a good baby, she said she didn't really know, as she only saw me at feed times and visiting times. That was one hour in the evening when Dad visited. When my nan and granddads came for a quick peek, then Dad would have to leave. I thought how sad that I was whisked away. It was a strict regime that Mum felt she dare not break, and I don't blame her because doctors and nurses still intimidate me now, and things aren't like they were then. There were no nighttime feeds for mums to deal with, as the babies were bottle fed in the nursery. It was a nice rest, not like today, where you have your baby and after a cup of tea you can go home. It was a two week stay then, and by the sounds of it, mum enjoyed herself. She had silver service, and she had said she was treated like royalty. Picking up the babies just to give them a cuddle was frowned on. When mum was home, she tells me she often wanted to cuddle me, but that wasn't thought best for baby, so she didn't do it. She said I was a good baby, but often worried if I had had enough milk, and so she weighed me after every feed, hiring the scales you could place baby in. All done strictly to the book, the new way, and a way that nanny, my dad's mum, thought was daft, Things weren't done like that in her day, but Mum thought she was doing the best for me. They christened me Penelope Ann after a character in a book Dad had read. Dad loved Cornwall. His aunt lived there and he visited quite a bit as he was growing up. I've managed to buy a copy of the book and after reading it can see why he liked the name and the character. As well as describing Penelope, it puts you right amongst the beaches villages and people of Cornwall. There was a hoo-ha around my christening. My cousin Tony was born at about the same time and Nanny wanted us to have a double christening. Mum thought this was a good idea as she believed in God and wanted me christened. Dad, however, didn't have a faith and couldn't promise that I would be brought up with one. He felt it was a personal decision. He couldn't speak for me. A decision you made you when you were older and could take responsibility for yourself. Finally, it went ahead and Dad attended but didn't take part. Whilst Mum was in hospital, the council had a sink installed in the small back room where the cooker was. There was an armchair for Dad to sit in and Mum said she sat on an upright chair but didn't seem at all faced by it when she told me. I felt so sorry that she was living like this and not being able to get help and support from her mum. After I'd had my two girls, she was an invaluable support to me. They had to put you up. Yes, the single bed had been, been traded in for a put you up and I slept in the pram. She proudly told me the pram was the new type that was collapsible, so necessary as she had to take it up two flights of stairs. During lockdown, Mum and I have had some super chats, which have become treasures to me. Finding out all these facts is one thing, but finding out that Mum loves cupboards has now become something I've understood so much better, living in those two small rooms for five years, and now with a baby. It must have been a challenge. I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, it's nice because I've been able to check every fact with mum. And uh, it, it's nice to know that because sometimes you can guess at these things and it's not quite right. I'll show you the book. Hang on a minute, I'll go and get it. Oh, here it is, Penelope Ann by J. Henry Harris. And as you can see, it's quite brown. William Pardew was amongst the workers, his sea boots sinking lower and lower in the pile of fish. Then he saw Penelope Ann scrambling down helter-skelter as none other would venture. But William Pardew, it's not a drawing. I'll show you. So all the characters are represented. Oh, here we go. 
Uncle Ben. But Penelope Ann, I don't think we've got a, a photo of Penelope Ann. We've got a drawing. To all lovers of Cornwall and the Cornish race and to that great Cornish family beyond the seas, I dedicate this book. So I'm going to go off now and have a drink and I'm going to come back and I'm going to have a little chat about adult and give you some more. Oh, it's going to take a time for you to understand adult. Don't panic. And then I'm going to just introduce the film. So I'm going to talk about TA for a little while now. Um, adult. Adult is the here and now. It's not contaminated, remember, by the parent or by the child. Thoughts, feelings and behaviours learned. Thoughts, feelings and behaviours replayed. Parent, child. Adult is the here and now. And that takes some doing. It really does. It takes some thinking about. Something comes to my mind when I first started, you know, getting into it and practicing it for myself. I was away and I was staying in a um, holiday home. And it was right in the middle of a wood. I mean, in the middle of it must have been a woodkeeper's cottage at one point black it was pitch black and um, I stayed there with my daughter and children and in the middle of the night my daughter came knocking on our bedroom door and said mum the front door's open giddy aren't I thought anyway we checked all round everywhere was fine and closed the front door but I got up the next morning and said, I want to go home. I don't want to stay here. Oh, how can I tell the others? I wonder what they're thinking. Oh, I don't like it. I'm frightened. I'm scared. Okay. Okay, I said. Now, I didn't say don't be silly. Because if we don't be silly, say don't be silly to child, that's the worst thing you can say. Acknowledge. Listen. Okay, I said. You're feeling scared. Yes, I said. I'm feeling very scared. Okay. I said in adult, here and now. Can I help? Oh, said child. I don't know. I just want to go home and I don't know how to tell the others. Well, is there anything I could do that might help you? Well, you could you could check the door three times tonight. Yeah, three times. I want you to check it three times to make sure it's locked. Okay, I said in adult, I can do that. Would that help? Oh, said child, yes. I don't feel scared anymore if you're going to do that. Right, oh, said adult, I'll do it. Oh, I felt instantly better. Why? Because I'd listened to my child. And adult had responded. So that night, well every night actually, I checked the door three times because I had promised. I was absolutely fine. I wasn't scared at all. I don't like a filing system in a way. How can I use all the resources around me to help? So adult is the here and now. Adult looked after my child. My child panicked a bit this week, I'll be honest with you. <gasps> I've got to do chin wag. Oh no, well, and you know, do people like, oh, 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 I've seen child quite a lot. It was ridiculous. I got on my own nerves. Adult got up, said, right, are we doing chin wag? Yes. Okay, let's see how we get on then. Adult said, see how it goes. If you don't feel up to it, then leave it for another day. Child said, oh, oh I couldn't do that. I have to get it done. No, nurturing parent said, no, you don't. If one doesn't go up one week, it's not the end of the world. Adult said the same. It's not the end of the world if it doesn't get done. You might just go on for a chat. How might that be? Can you see the different parts of us that help? Once adults in play, you feel a lot better. You feel a lot stronger because you're looking at things through the reality of, through glasses of reality. Is it really so? That's a good question to ask. Is it really so? Is that true? 
let's have a look, see, see what's going on here and now that we can back that up. Yeah. So there we are. That's the bit on TA. So I'm going to run straight into the little bit of film. And I want to talk about observation because I think as birders, we do observe. You know, I, I never observed, did I? Until I saw those two white-tailed sea eagles. Boy, I started observing then. And this little film that I'm going to put up is all about observation. We started out off on our walk. And the first thing Pete said was, green woodpecker over there on the wall. It was a long way away. I mean, my camera's good, as you know. But it was, you know, it was a good, well, it was a field away. And you know what? I looked it up and you know what it said? Oh, low battery. Do you know what it said? It said observation is a very good thing to be observant. Why? Because it uses all the different sides of your brain. The neuroplasticity. Do you remember I talked about that? The neuroplasticity. It makes new synapses all the time when we're observant. And so it's very good for our brain. Yeah. So I'm pleased that I'm an observant person. And when we went out on the walk with this little film, we were being observant. Saw the birds, saw this, saw that. And then when we were in Ramsgate, we saw a statue. I mean, we've lived here since 1984. And there's a statue. I said to Pete, whose statue is that? Oh, huh? it's Pugin. And Pugin is one of our family, well, we always laugh. Pugin! Because when I was on holiday, that one that I was talking about, you know, with when we were in the woodman's house, we looked over a National Trust property and we had a um, we had a guide show us round. And Pugin, it was all about Pugin. Well, he did the Big Ben, you know, uh, Houses of Parliament. He lived in Ramsgate. And the house is there, actually. You can hire it. It's exquisite. But uh, this guide who took us round, Pugin, told us everything about him, what size pants he took, you know. And our little granddaughter, she was quite young at the time. And uh, when we came out, she's a great mimic. And she mimicked, Pugin, Pugin. So there we are in Ramsgate, walking past Pugin's, you know, bust. So took that, carried on walking, and then, oh, I love that program, do you? It's on a Tuesday, Saving Lives at Sea. And then we heard the the siren of the RLNI, and um, yeah, I'll show you. They rescued some people, and uh, on that Friday, I think it was 460 people arrived in Dingis, and on the, the next day, the Saturday, I think it was 600 and 648 or something like that arrived. So I thought that was a very good thing. When you go to counselling, right at the beginning, you learn unconditional positive regard. And really, that's where I started out talking about TA. I'm okay, you're okay. It's not about who we are, what we do as human beings. I'm okay, you're okay. And that's where we start with TA. And as counsellors, that's where we start with unconditional positive regard. And I just thought those RLNI men, on went their boots and I filmed them. And I mean, the boat was practically at Broadstairs and we were in Ramsgate, but my camera was quite good. It's a little bit shaky, but you know, it, it takes a long way. You've seen with the moon, it takes a long way. And um, it was so emotional. Boy, did I feel emotional when I got back. It was so emotional. And yet, I took pictures. There's the builders building new flats. People are having the coffee and their lunch. Not a blind bit of notice as to what was going on. So yeah, how good it is for us to be observant. When we look around, what do we see? What's happening? It's all good for neuroplasticity. It's all good for the synapses. And that will keep our brain healthy. So, maybe it's just good to be nosy. So I'll put the film up now and I'll say cheerio. This is a goodbye and I'll see you next week. It's been lovely to spend my time with you and thanks for watching. Bye.
call again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can. Going down, and then it'll launch out. 